Welcome to lecture number 17 for EE206 circuits 1, capacitors and heat equation. Now so far we've been looking at resistors. There are other circuit elements, namely capacitors and inductors. We'll start with capacitors. A capacitor is a set of parallel plates where the capacitance is a constant, epsilon, times the area of the capacitor divided by the distance between them. And here kind of the area idea is if you have two parallel plates and I put plus charges on one side, the other side will attract minus charges. This is kind of like going down a slide as a kid when you build up static electricity on yourself. You're essentially the parallel plate capacitor. You're the plus side. The earth is the ground. When you touch your mom or dad's nose, you get a big shock. That's the capacitor discharging. A capacitor will store some energy. Um, not a lot, but there is some there. And that energy can be used in circuits. Now the uh, unit of capacitance is a farad. To give an idea what one farad is, suppose I have a parallel plate capacitor where the plates are one millimeter apart. The area that you would need would be 113 million cubic meters, which is 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what one farad is. Most capacitors are much, much smaller than one farad. They're typically in the order of microfarads or nanofarads. You can actually get one microfarad capacitors. What they do is they make the distance much smaller. That increases the capacitance. And instead of using air, use dielectric. That increases the capacitance. But still, a one farad capacitor is about the size of this coffee can. The charge stored in a capacitor is the capacitance times voltage. And here, charge is in coulombs. One coulomb is 6.2 times 10 to the 18th electrons. Once I have charge is capacitance times voltage, I can find the VI characteristics. Take the derivative, coulombs per second is amps. Take the derivative, assuming C is a constant, I get I equals C dV dt. That's the basic equation for capacitors. The current is the change in voltage. What that means is that capacitors essentially turn a circuit into a differential equation. You need calculus or differential equations to analyze circuits with capacitors. As mentioned before, capacitors store energy. The energy stored is 1 half CV squared. If I integrate the previous equation, I equals C dV dt, multiplied by V integrate, I get 1 half CV squared. What that means is that if I have a 1 farad capacitor, that can store 12.5 joules of energy. And that's not a whole lot. But if I could supply 12.5 joules for one millisecond, that's 12.5 kilowatts. Capacitors essentially provide energy in a circuit for very small amounts of time, small bursts. I could also use those for energy storage, but as, uh, as some, some comparison, a one farad capacitor stores 12 joules of energy. A lithium D-sized battery stores 200,000 joules of energy. A one point of gasoline is 15 million joules. And one pound of North Dakota coal is 1.5 million joules. In terms of cost per megajoule, the cheapest would be Wyoming coal. That's part of the reason we burn so much coal in this country for electricity. Gasoline is a lot more expensive. So likewise, we don't use gasoline to power, to produce electricity, but we do use it for cars. It's got a very high energy density. Uh, electric cars use lithium batteries. You could, in theory, build a car using capacitors. What that would do is that would give you a car where the charging time is on the order of seconds, not hours. I could recharge my car millions of times, but as you can see by the cost, the cost of the car would be about a thousand times more. As mentioned earlier, the differential equation relating voltage and current for capacitors I equals C dV dt, where the voltage is 1 over C times the integral of current. What that means is that every circuit that has a capacitor in it is actually described by differential equations. And the order of the differential equation can be found just by counting. Each capacitor adds one term to the differential equation. N capacitors means you've got a coupled nth order differential equation to describe the circuit. That's part of the reason you took taking all the math classes. You need calculus to solve differential equations. In this class, we'll write the differential equation for a circuit with capacitors and then solve using phasers. 
that's assuming you have a sine wave input, that'll be coming up shortly, or using numerical methods. Using MATLAB, I can integrate and solve differential equations. When you get to circuits two and signals and systems, you'll be using Laplace transforms. Laplace transforms let you find the exact solution um, in closed form. The numerical methods we'll do in this course find an approximate solution, but at least let you solve. Now to solve differential equations using numerical methods, uh, meaning MATLAB, I need to come up with an algorithm to convert integration, or to implement integration numerically. Uh, that's a whole field of mathematics, numerical integration. All of them are slightly wrong, but you can get closer and closer with more elaborate schemes. There are several types of integration. There's Euler, trapezoid, rugged cutter. There's many, many more. These will give you approximate answers. Again, if you want the exact answer, you need to use calculus or Laplace transforms. Um, that'll be coming up in circuits too. In terms of numerical methods, uh, there's a couple types of integration. The one that we'll be using is Euler integration. That's the simplest form and also the least accurate. The nice thing about Euler integration is it doesn't need past information. If I have my function x of t, I don't know what x of t at each time point, I can tell you what the area under the curve is approximately. So what you do is area is width times height for a rectangle. Take the blue curve, the function that we want to integrate, take the samples every t seconds, and then just say this area is roughly width times height. At time zero, the height was zero, the width is t, the area is zero. At this point, I've got the height times width, height times width. Add up the rectangles and you roughly have the area. And as you notice, this is not the most accurate scheme, but if I make the sampling rate small, the error will be fairly small and it should work fairly well. The thing I like about Euler integration is it's not too bad and it's easy. I like easy. There are better algorithms. There's trapezoid rule. Instead of using a rectangle, use a trapezoid. Here what I do is at time t, I need to remember what was x of t at the previous sample, what's x of t at the current sample, take the average of the two, times the width, add it to the previous area, and it gets the red line. It's the area of a trapezoid plus the previous areas. And as you can see, trapezoid rule is much more accurate than Euler integration, uh, but it does need memory. I need to remember what the input was last sample, which complicates the code and hence the reason I'm not going to be using it. Uh, there's still an error there. You kind of notice this has got a bend. The trapezoid rule doesn't capture that bend. If I go to Runka Kutta integration, then what you're doing is I take the two points, the left end point, the right end point, a couple points in the middle, and then do a polynomial curve fit. If I have four points, four points defines a cubic, I can curve this with a cubic polynomial and get better approximation for the area. Uh, that's fourth order rugged cutta. There's also a fifth order rugged cutta, do a fifth, fourth order polynomial, uh, third order rugged cutta, do a cubic or a parabolic curve fit. It's basically just trying to do a curve fit, approximate the area into a curve. Rugged cutta is used in quite a few other algorithms. I think it's what's used in Circuit Lab. Uh, we'll just be using Euler integration because it's easy. So by using Euler integration, what I want to do is find to find the voltage, find the derivative of the voltage from i equals c d b d t. The derivative of the voltage is the current divided by capacitance. I can then integrate. The area under the curve is the old area plus height times width. And that'll give me v of t. As an example, uh, suppose I had this circuit. The voltage is initially at zero volts, meaning everything's discharged. At t equals zero, it turns on, turns on to 10 volts. Find V1 of t. To do that, I want to find the current through, through the capacitor because I is CD VDT. I'll then integrate. To find IC, IC is IA plus IB, which is V0 minus V1 over two, plus zero minus V1 over 100. That's CD VDT. Solve for DV, DVDT, and I get this differential equation. So that's what I want to integrate. And MATLAB, I can do that. I'll start out, say, by saying the voltage is initially zero. My input, B0, is 10. There's my step size, 0.01 second. Uh, the smaller this is, the longer it takes to run, but the more accurate the program. 
and then I'll write it for one second. At every time point, I'll calculate, knowing the voltage, knowing the input, find dV dt. Now integrate, go forward in time by 10 milliseconds, recalculate voltage, and repeat. Find the new derivative, recalculate, repeat. Find the new derivatives, recalculate. Keep going through a loop. As we go through it, save the voltage versus time, then plot it. And that's what voltage looks like. This is typical for capacitors. I'm going to charge up to a steady state value. And this will be an exp exponential rise. I can check my answer in CircuitLab. CircuitLab really does the numerical solution as well. If I put in the circuit, I'm going to specify the input V3 to be a zero volt offset, uh, 10 volt peak square wave. Uh, low frequency, just meaning I want it to stay high for the duration of the simulation. And just a slight phase shift. What that does is that forces the voltage to zero at t equals zero, and then right away, the output voltage will jump to 10. I'll then run the simulation for one second, make the step size one millisecond, so we get a thousand points on the plot. And the solution looks just like the previous solution. More complicated circuit. Let's look at trying to solve a three-stage RC filter. In this case, I just write, what is the current I1, I2, I3? I1 is the current from the left, V0 minus V1 over 2, plus this current, 0 minus V1 over 100, plus the current from the right, V2 minus V1 over 2. That's equal to I1, which is CD, VDT. Likewise for V2, likewise for I3. Divide by C, and I get the differential equations for V1, V2, V3. So these are the differential equations I want to solve. To solve, I'll use numerical methods. If I know the voltages, initially these are zero, but they're going to change, I can find the derivative, integrate, and I get the voltage 10 milliseconds later. Plug those back in, find the voltages another 10 milliseconds later, and so on. That's numerical integration. What that looks like in MATLAB is, at any given time point, I know the derivative of the voltages. I'll then integrate, go forward 10 milliseconds, save the data, repeat. Then when I plot the data, here's what it looks like. This is V1 of t, quickly goes up, and then reaches steady state. V1 then charges up V2, which then charges up V3. That's your voltages versus time. In circuit lab, I could do the same thing, and I get the same answer. Now let's do a third case. Let's do a 10-stage RC filter. This is also a heat equation. With an RC filter, I've got a voltage V0, that raises the voltage on V1, that raises the voltage on V2, raises the voltage on V3, and so on. This also satisfies the heat equation. Heat equation are coupled first order differential equations. If this is a temperature, the temperature at V0 warms up the temperature at one, warms up the temperature at two, warms up the temperature at three. This circuit satisfies the same differential equation that heat, heat down to a metal rod would satisfy. Has the name heat equation. Being a 10th order circuit, this looks like a nasty 10th order differential equation. It's actually not too bad. Due to symmetry, the differential equation in each node are all the same. It's the same as the previous one, uh, just V2 is a function of the previous node, V1, and the next node, V3. All the way out up until the 10th node. The last node is slightly different because there isn't a second 2 ohm resistor attached to it, so we just get a slightly different equation. And MATLAB, this is where for loops are nice. I could write 10 equations like before, or just put this in a for loop. I'm going to um, calculate the, the left node, where I have V0. Nodes 2 through 9 is just the same. And then the 10th node. Run it and integrate. And I can now run it. If I run it, what happens is this is the voltage at node 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Node 1 quickly charges up to its steady state value, which then warms up, or charges up 2, 3, and 4. This is also the temperature along a metal beam. If I raise the base temperature to 10 degrees Celsius, the heat will flow along the beam, eventually warm it all up. Hence the name of heat equation. And eventually, it then will plot the voltages versus time. So this is V1, V2, V3, V4, and so on. 
if you run the simulation circle lab this is what circle lab shows you the other one the animation is kind of fun um, battle lab actually does a pretty good job with the animation and things to note what that program does is it solves a 10th order couple differential equation the voltages represent the voltages on each capacitor as they charge they also represent the temperature along a metal bar hence the name of the heat equation In terms of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, in Math 129, Linear Algebra, you study eigenvalues, eigenvectors. This is where they actually apply. If I take the differential equations for the system and write it in matrix form, V dot equals AV plus BV zero, here's the matrix. That matrix right there has eigenvalues, eigenvectors. In MATLAB, I can find that. First input the A matrix, and here's a shortcut. You don't have to type in all 100 entries. Most of them are zero, so we'll start out with the zero matrix. The diagonal is minus 10.1. So for the first nine terms, make it minus 10.1. The off diagonal terms are five. And then when you're done, this last term right here is actually minus 5.1. So that's inputting the A matrix. Once you have the A matrix, I can find the eigenvalues, eigenvectors. That's the command EIG in MATLAB. The eigenvectors tell you what behaves that way. The eigenvalues tell you how it behaves. I've got 10 capacitors. I've got 10 eigenvalues. Some charge up or discharge really, really slowly. Some charge up really fast. The eigenvector tells you what is fast, what is slow. For example, this eigenvector, if I make that my initial condition, will decay as e to the minus 0.2t. If this is my initial condition, that'll decay as e to the minus 19t. In MATLAB, I can do that. If I make, here's my initial condition scaled, so that the biggest voltage is 10. If I then run this, run that, notice the shape stays the same. The shape is the eigenvector. I've only excited one eigenvector, so likewise, I'm only going to get this one shape out. The eigenvalue, minus 0.22, is how it behaves. This amplitude drops as e to the minus 0.22t or it's very, very slow. In contrast, let's make the initial condition the fast eigenvector. If I make that my initial condition, there's my response. This decays at e to the minus 29t, or so fast you missed it. I'll slow this down by a factor 10, make dt 10 times smaller. And now you can see the eigenvector, the shape stays the same, that's the eigenvector. It's now decaying as e to the minus 22t. And running again, so that's what eigenvalues, eigenvectors are. Eigenvector tells you what behaves that way. Eigenvalue tells you how it behaves. Finally, suppose my initial condition is random. In that case, I get this response. When it's a random input, I excite all modes all 10 of the eigenvalues, all 10 eigenvectors. The quick modes quickly go away, leaving you with the slow modes. Let's rerun that again, make time a little bit faster. When I run it, when I run it, again, all modes are initially excited, the quick ones go away, and what I'm left with is the shape, that's the slow mode, that's the dominant eigenvector, that's the pole at minus 0.21. That's where eigenvalues, eigenvectors are important. What I see is there's one mode that really dominates response. That's the slow eigenvector. No matter what my initial condition is, I'll eventually converge to that shape. That's because the other modes are much quicker. They quickly go away, leaving you with the slow mode. So that's uh, lecture number 17 for EE206, circuits one capacitors.